Imagine, if you will, a distant world, a frozen moon encased in ice, circling a vast planet. Beneath its surface lies a lightless ocean, a dark and secret world lit only by the flares of seafloor volcanoes. Stable for billions of years, this ocean of endless night has all the ingredients for life, liquid water, complex chemicals, abundant energy in the form of hydrothermal vents. In fact, it may already be home to alien creatures, perhaps microbes, perhaps something far more complex. What do you think it might take to study such a remote world? What sort of engineering magic would be required for humanity to fly out there and see what lies beneath? Well, good news. We already know the answer. Set to launch in 2024, Europa Clipper is one of the biggest, most complex crafts that NASA has ever designed. Larger than a basketball court and equipped with nine cutting-edge instruments, it's going to try and answer one of the most profound questions of all. Are we alone in the universe? In the mid-19th century, they were an awe-inspiring, if familiar, sight. The great clipper ships with their three masts slicing through the waves of the Atlantic, carrying tea and spices. Fast forward over 150 years, and their modern namesake is certainly less familiar, but the awe it inspires is as great as ever. Currently being assembled at JPL for a fall 2024 launch, the Europa Clipper is superlative in every sense of the world. Standing at 5 meters tall, or 60 feet for those of us who hate sensible measurements, the craft's main body consists mostly of a propulsion module about equal in size to an SUV, one equipped with 24 separate engines. Now, that's not crazy big for a spacecraft, but we're only talking about height so far. It's the Clipper's width that's really impressive. Designed to run on solar power, Europa Clipper comes equipped with vast arrays to capture incoming light. How vast? Well, Jupiter and its moons are five times further from the sun than Earth is. That means Clipper needs arrays large enough to capture sunlight that to human eyes would appear dim and distant. The result is a pair of solar-paneled wings so big that taken together they span 30 meters. That's the size of a basketball court, or to put it in a slightly more colorful yet less basketball-related way, as long as 14 illegally cloned Shaquille O'Neal's lying head to toe in a row. No other NASA craft yet launched on a planetary mission has come close to this size, nor is the solar array the only bit of mechanical gigantism on display. Sticking profoundly out of the craft like the mast of a 19th century ship, the onboard magnetometer boom is equally impressive, clocking in at a staggering 8.5 meters or 25 feet. Now, we'll be going into its uses in a later chapter today, but for now, just know that it's so big that it has to be stowed away for launch, only deploying when the clipper is safely out in space. And speaking of space, this might be a good time to geek out a little bit about the part that's actually going to take the craft through the void, the propulsion module. As we mentioned earlier, this module is the main part of Clippy, with two dozen engines to guide her to Europa. And that requires some serious behind-the-scenes kit. Deep inside the module itself, a huge tangle of wires and connectors arises like the trunk of a tree, shooting different branches out to deliver power where it's needed. Known as the harness, it weighs a total of 68 kilograms. Like with the solar array, though, and certain other things, it really is the length here that counts. Completely unfolded, the harness would stretch 640 meters or 2,100 feet or just a really, really long freaking way. Ado is also pretty freaking large. The Clipper's weight. At launch, with all of its fuel included, Europa Clipper is going to weigh an eye-watering 6,000 kilograms. That's 13,000 pounds, uh, which Gil O'Neill could only achieve by somehow cannibalizing 40 cloned copies of himself. Now, we mentioned this to you to give you some idea of how much went into building just the basic body of Europa Clipper. That's before we get into any of the specialized instruments. And trust me, we're going to be doing a deep dive on those instruments soon enough, so 
stay tuned. But first, to really understand what makes them so special, we need to look at the place they'll be measuring. The remote icy moon that NASA has made its recent focus, one of only a tiny handful of places outside Earth that may be home to life. Europa. All told, the cost of Europa Clipper is currently estimated at $5 billion. That's a lot of money. It's less than the 9.7 invested in the James Webb Space Telescope, but it's still significantly more than the $2.9 billion that NASA spent sending the Perseverance rover and Ingenuity helicopter to Mars. All this raises a big question. Why? Why spend so much money sending a craft not to Jupiter, but to one of its 80-something moons? And the answer lies beneath the surface of Europa's cracked and icy shell. 15 to 25 kilometers beneath, to be exact. Down here, in the dark, locked away from sunlight, NASA scientists are convinced there lies a layer of water. A vast, unfathomable ocean. And where we find water on Earth, we nearly always find that most precious thing of all. Life. Ice shell aside, Europa is thought to not be too dissimilar to Earth, an iron core and rocky mantle around which stretches a thin layer of habitability. In Europa's case, that habitable layer comes in the form of a saltwater ocean, one of the most unimaginable depths. Here on Earth, the deepest point is the Mariana Trench, which bottoms out at an astonishing 11 kilometers or roughly 7 miles. Europa, by contrast, laughs at such puny measurements. Although it'll take the clipper to really confirm this, it's currently thought that the moon's ocean stretches down between 60 and 150 kilometers. That means there could be 100 miles of water between the mantle and the ice shell. An abyss of night so sublime, so overwhelming, it would give HP Lovecraft nightmares. Nor do the crazy numbers stop there? With a diameter of only 3,120 kilometers, Europa is a dwarf next to Earth, smaller even than our moon. So it stands to reason that Earth, with its mighty oceans, must hold more water. Right? Well, not even close. Thanks to its sheer dizzying depth, Europa's ocean is thought to contain 3 billion cubic kilometers of water, enough to drown so many Shaquille O'Neal's that it doesn't bear thinking about. Earth, on the other hand, holds less than half of that, a mere 1.3 billion cubic kilometers. And that's incredibly exciting, because Earth's oceans are teeming with life. NASA estimates somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of all life forms live in our seas. Now, it's important to remember that water isn't the only ingredient that's necessary for life to evolve. Any environment looking to cook up some funky sea creatures needs two other things besides water. The correct cocktail of chemicals and an energy source. Luckily, the icy moon is thought to have both. Since Europa is so far from the sun, it should really be just a ball of solid and inert ice. The fact it isn't, at least once you've drilled down far enough, means that there must be an internal heat source. And in this case, it's friction. Because Europa is one of four major moons circling Jupiter, it isn't only the planet that's exerting a gravitational pull on it. The moons Io and Ganymede likewise tug at Europa's shell as they pass. This stretches and pulls the planet, creating friction heat, which in turn likely gives rise to things like hydrothermal vents. Chimneys pouring out a stream of energy and chemicals, hydrothermal vents are a classic location for finding life on Earth. At the same time, the tidal heating might also be powering an invisible cycle, exchanging nutrients between the rocky sea floor and the ice shelf, creating an ideal primordial soup. And given the soup is thought to have been stable for nearly four billion years, life has had plenty of time to find a way. And it may just be getting its energy thanks to the same thing that makes Europa's surface so hostile. Radiation. Europa's shell is so blasted with radiation that nothing could live there. But that same radiation also rips apart the water molecules in the moon's atmosphere, splitting the oxygen and the hydrogen. With the hydrogen drifting off into space, the oxygen may somehow be recycled back through the ice and into the sea. Since it's such a radioactive molecule, it could potentially provide fuel for anything living down there. So that's the why Europa part out of the way. Now for the really interesting bit. So let's dig deep into the suite of instruments the Clipper will use to uncover the secrets of this world.
When designing Europa Clipper, NASA evidently subscribed to the uh, go big or go home school of planetary science. The sheer number of specialized instruments the craft is carrying is insane. A payload of nine individual pieces of kit plus a high quality camera will all work together to unlock this moon's mysteries. Given there are so many of them, we don't realistically have time to explore each instrument. So what we're going to do is focus on some of the coolest in order to give you a flavor of what the Clipper is going to be capable of. Perhaps the coolest is the radar array known as Reason. Standing for Radar for Europa Assessment and Sounding Ocean to Near Surface, Reason looks to the layman like nothing more than a giant antenna thingy, like some folk in the 1950s might have used to watch Leave it to Beaver. But Reason's raison d'etre isn't to check in on Wally and the gang, but to send out high frequency radio waves that will pierce Europa's ice to a depth of 30 kilometers. That means NASA will be able to build a detailed picture of the ice's structure. More importantly, though, it will provide confirmation that Europa's ocean exists. Right now, there are so many odd things about Europa that the only realistic explanation is the existence of a subsurface ocean. But knowing it theoretically isn't the same thing as actually confirming it's there. This is what Reason will hopefully do, provide that solid proof. More importantly, Reason should also detect any pools of water lying close to the ice shell surface, potentially where they're more accessible. Combined with Europa Clipper Magnetometer, abbreviated as ECM, it should paint a pretty amazing picture of Europa's silent seas. The massive 8 meter plus mast that we talked about in the first chapter, the ECM is designed to measure changes in the Moon's magnetosphere. A byproduct of Jupiter's own magnetosphere, Europa's is thought to be caused by electric currents flowing through the salty subsurface ocean. Using the data gathered by the ECM, NASA will be able to figure out how deep that ocean really is. The result will be our first deep understanding of an extraterrestrial ocean, a feat NASA will be hoping to recreate with later missions to the Saturnian moon and Celadus. Yet, while the work of Reason and the ECM will broaden our understanding of Europa, they won't answer the most pressing question. Can this alien ocean harbor life? Hence the need for Mars, mass specs, and Suda. The Mapping Imaging Spectrometer for Europe, MISE is going to closely examine the Moon's surface, hunting for signatures of the specific molecules that exist there. Mostly this will be stuff like sulfates and carbonates, but the team will also be searching for organics, the building blocks of life. At the same time, MASPEX, or the Mass Spectrometer of Planetary Exploration, will be performing a similar hunt among the Moon's gases. With its gassy vents, Europa is like your underpants after the end of a sweaty gym session. Absolutely funky with fumes. Mass specs, meanwhile, is like the locker room pervert giving them a cheeky sniff. Although, rather than getting off, mass specs will be converting them into arms and running tests to figure out what they are. With a resolution hundreds of times greater than anything sent into space before it, it's going to determine what's in Europa's plumes, including any possible biosignatures. And finally, Suda, the surface dust analyzer, will do all the same for tiny bits of ejecta swirling around Europa. It'll examine them to see if any point towards the presence of organics. And this is just a tiny fraction of what the clipper will do. Other instruments will take thermal readings, run experiments into plasma, collect ultraviolet light, and use Doppler shifts in Europa's radar signal to uncover its internal structure. Honestly, there's enough here for us to do seven more videos on this craft, each digging down further into the geeky science of it all. But sadly, we don't have time for all of that today. Because there's still one more major thing that we need to talk about. The mission itself. On a clear day in October 2024, as America is consumed with the partisan rancor of an imminent election, a SpaceX Falcon Heavy will take off from Florida's Kennedy Space Center, carrying a rare symbol of unity. It will be the start of Europa Clipper's journey to the fifth planet, a journey intended by Congress to give Americans a scientific achievement that they can be collectively proud of. At least, once it gets there. To make it to Jupiter, the Clipper will have to take a weird route, swinging round Mars in February 2025, looping back to Earth for Christmas 2026, and then shooting off into the void yet again. This is to give the craft a gravity assist, accelerating it to much higher speeds than fuel alone would allow, thus shaving years off its journey. But this is the straightforward part, a simple means for traversing the millions of empty kilometers. 
It's once the Clipper reaches Jupiter in April 2030 that things will start to get complicated. The first thing to note is how we said reaches Jupiter rather than reaches Europa, for the very good reason that Europa Clipper won't orbit Europa at all. Jupiter's magnetic field is so powerful it generates a vast radiation belt looping around the planet, a loop Europa falls into. That means radiation levels so high that Clipper would be rendered inoperable within a month if it orbited the moon. And NASA isn't spending $5 billion for a mere month of science. Instead, the Clipper will enter an elliptical orbit around Jupiter, one that allows it to go zooming in for multiple Europa flybys, minimizing the time spent in this planetary Chernobyl. Yet even these small doses will require an extraordinary level of shielding. Inside the Clipper, a special aluminium alloy box known as the Vault will seal the craft's electronics behind a shield nearly 10 millimeters thick, a countermeasure against Jupiter's radiation first designed for the Juno spacecraft. Thus protected, the Clipper will be able to make a grand total of 49 flybys spaced two to three weeks apart, fewer than the 53 originally planned, but still more than enough to get a truly spectacular look at this alien world. World. And nor will it be the only probe to do so. Just as Europa Clipper is one of NASA's biggest missions this decade, so too is JUICE, an example of the European Space Agency pulling out at all the stops. A somewhat bizarre acronym of Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, JUICE will arrive at Planet 5 a year after Clipper. And while its main focus will be exploring Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede, it will also be conducting flybys of Callisto and Europa. In other words, we're going to see a brief period in the early 2030s when two of the most advanced probes yet built are turning all of their instruments onto this distant moon, teasing out its secrets, developing a whole new understanding of its past and present. So, it's only natural that NASA wants to return the favor. Originally, the idea was to end the Clipper mission by deliberately diverting the craft into Jupiter, where it would be destroyed by unimaginable forces. Ever since Europa's potential for supporting life was discovered, all Jupiter moon missions have ended this way. There's just too much risk of probes crashing into Europa and contaminating it. But not the Clipper. Instead, NASA plans to deliberately crash it into Ganymede. Although Ganymede is also thought to have a subsurface ocean, it's far too deep below the crust for any chance of contamination. And with Juice watching the show, the impact could give the ESA a wealth of data to uncover even more about the solar system's biggest moon. It'll be a brutal, high-speed death for a project costing $5 billion, but it will mean the Clipper contributing to science right up until the end. By then, of course, it will have already transformed our understanding of the Jovian system. The moment it impacts Ganymede Europa Clipper it will have been circling Jupiter for years, generating unimaginable reams of data. Data that may open the door to us finding alien life in our own cosmic backyard. In some ways, it's hard to even process this. So potentially world-changing might Clipper's discoveries be that it's hard to imagine what's going to come next. Although, well, NASA already has a plan. Known as the Europa Lander, the proposal has yet to be funded, but if selected, it could be ready to launch in 2027, arriving as a follow-up probe toward the end of Clipper's life. And while the Clipper will see if Europa is potentially habitable, the Lander would go one step further. Touching down on the icy surface, it would drill down 10 centimeters, 4 inches, they were near deep enough to catch a glimpse of alien fish, but deep enough that chemicals from the ocean below wouldn't have been damaged by Jupiter's radiation. Using an onboard laboratory, it would examine these samples and maybe, just maybe, it would find solid proof of something living far below the surface of this ocean world. Of course, this follow-up mission may never happen. It might be that NASA decides its limited budget is better spent elsewhere. But whether the lander flies or not, there's no doubting that Europa Clipper will go down in history. The modern version of a great 19th century ship setting out to sea on a mission not of trade or of commerce but of exploration and unimaginable adventure.